Hey everyone, for those of you that are going to make it tonight, we are so excited to uh, join with you. And for those of you that are watching this online, that is incredible as well. Um, your leaders have been reaching out to you. And if you haven't heard from us directly, uh, then send us a message on Instagram or email me at rdawson at parkridgechurch.com. We would love to engage you, see how we can pray for you, even from a distance. Uh, so we encourage you to stay safe, and we just want to let you know that we love you. Tonight, we are going to continue uh, our series through Ephesians uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. And last week, we talked about the rich blessings that God has for his people. We saw that played out in some amazing ways. So you can go back and watch uh, last week's message either on our church's YouTube channel or on Park Ridge underscore students Instagram. So we would love for you to join us there. But it is amazing how quickly we can get bored. Uh, I can think of so many times where maybe I've started to watch a video or started to listen to a podcast or an audiobook or started to watch a show or a movie that I thought was going to entertain me. And after a minute, my attention span is totally somewhere else or I've turned it off and gone to do something else. Some of you guys uh, know exactly what I'm talking about. But when you strike that chord of something that you're passionate about, it keeps your attention. Uh, for some of you, you can be stuck on a video game for hours. For others of you, it is talking about your favorite sports team. Others, it's hanging out with a best friend and you guys can do whatever and you have this amazing time. One of the things that I love and we see here tonight as Paul is continuing this letter to the church in Ephesus is that he has a laser focus. Yeah, he travels a lot of different places. He's seen some amazing things. But what really changes who he is and what he's experienced is primarily his relationship with Christ. And so boredom isn't something in his repertoire. It's not something that he is accustomed to. And you see this in the way he writes really all of chapter one. He's crazy passionate about Jesus. He's amazed at what he's done. And we see this uh, celebrating tone in his writing here. It's like he cannot uh, write the words out quick enough. So here, join in chapter 1, verse 15. It says, This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. So he's talked about all the amazing things they have through God the Father, through Christ the Son, and through the Spirit. And then as he's moving into this, he's saying, you guys are a new people. You're people who love Jesus and you love one another. And I'm amazed at where you were versus where you are now because of Jesus. And I'm keeping celebrating that. I am cheering you on. So Paul is a passionate fan and really spiritual father of the church in Ephesus. And then as he continues writing, he says, in verse 17, I pray that the God of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So he's praying for wisdom through life, wisdom in the spirit, and a revelation of who God is. Now, Paul was amazed because if you remember his conversion on the road to Damascus, it was this tangible, miraculous picture of Jesus, and there's this shining light. There's this audible voice. So he's got this revelation and he's not saying church in Ephesus, you need that specific, uh, tangible miracle moment. But he's saying, even if your hearts were to have a revelation of God's goodness and what he has given to you in Christ and the spirit, you would be amazed. You would be as fired up as I am. This would be like, uh, your team is in the Super Bowl and you are thrilled. Okay. So then as things continue, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What is the wealth? Again, there's that, uh, he's, he's showing the beauty, not in what's found in earth, but 
the wealth, the glory, the riches of what's given to those who have repented of their sins and placed their faith in Christ. So he says, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength? So in this moment, he is telling us that God is immensely powerful and he's reminded us that even the down payment, the deposit of what we have to come is the Holy Spirit within those who would believe and follow Jesus. And he's saying, you can experience goodness even now. You can make a difference. You can live out the Great Commission. You can build the kingdom right now in your families, in your neighborhoods, and throughout your city. And this uh, entire place and the world beyond can change if you would just grab a hold of what God is doing. And so his prayer for them is that they would get more of Jesus and that they would see him clearly. And if their focus, if the eyes of their hearts were to be totally turned towards him, then everything would change. And that's really the prayer that uh, I believe is crucial for all of us today in the middle of so many things that can distract us, right? Uh, you can be streaming something on Netflix while watching video after video on TikTok and texting your friend. And for some of us, that is a normal train of thought for our brain, but our souls, if we aren't careful, go to that same distraction mode. And Satan would love to do nothing more than to pull the affections of your heart away from Christ to the point where you don't know how to love anymore. And so his prayer is that you would understand the goodness of Christ. Maybe that you would, uh, for us, slow some things down, turn some channels off, turn down the volume in your life and tune in to what Christ can say and, and what he's calling you to in this moment. And then as the passage continues in verse 20, it says he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. So this power that you have access to was displayed primarily in the resurrection. And it's displayed again and again and again every time a sinner who, again, is deserving of death apart from Christ, who has no hope alone, uh, can't work, can't pull enough decency to make themselves right with God, so only Jesus can bridge the gap and there's that resurrection power on display every time someone is redeemed by the blood of Christ and uh, brought from death to life. But he's saying here, primarily in the hope of the resurrection, you have a new life and what you're seeing happen in your community is a result of the resurrection. And now we're going to see in this letter that the church in Ephesus is not perfect, but God is doing a work and Paul is saying, Follow Jesus, lean into the Holy Spirit, uh, fellowship with one another, stay accountable, turn from sin, share the gospel, and uh, this once dark place is going to shine brighter and brighter for the kingdom. So then he's saying, look, if, if a taste of this power was primarily displayed in the resurrection. And then in verse 21, he says, far above every ruler and authority power and dominion and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. This is good news for us because 2020 has been chaotic. We know the Bible is a great source of news that uh, the world will have trouble, that things are going to continually get more difficult, but God is on his throne and his power is superior above all powers and he has a plan for you and I uh, to remain near to him, to follow the shepherd no matter where he leads us. And so in these moments, it's crucial for us to remember that uh, though things may seem troubling, though things may seem chaotic, his power is far greater than uh, any other power on earth. So even rulers that think that they have things uh, under control in and of themselves, uh, that is nothing compared to the power that God has as he rules the world. And he didn't stop. It was from then and for every age to come. And then as he closes chapter one, 
It says, and he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him being Jesus over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. It's a privilege that we see this picture that Paul was inspired to give us of the church being the body of Christ, remaining on earth as one, working together to uh, be a, a type or an example, uh, continuing the work that Jesus displayed on earth. So while we cannot save ourselves, while only Jesus was perfect, we're an example in the way that we love God and the way that we serve him and the way that we submit to uh, his will as we look to Jesus primarily as our example. And then also in the way that we love others, in the way that despite our differences, despite our sin, despite our failure, there is a unifying type of love that the world looks at and says, that is working. That is what I need. That is something different than what I hear about on my news feed, that is something different than what's talked about on the radio, on the way to work. That is something different than what I see in the hallways of my high school. And so this gospel changes us, but it also brings an incredible wealth as it changes those around us. And as we say, we're no longer living for our own personal agenda, but we are living fully submitted to Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for tuning in for this second week as we learn about the incredible wealth and power that God has displayed upon us. And pursuing that eternally is so much greater than pursuing things that will let us down and leave us bored here on earth. We'll see you guys soon.